All right, Second Timothy chapter 3. Bear with me if I get a little passionate, okay? Because uh, this is a deep chapter. Beginning in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, My purpose, faith, long-suffering, love and perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That is a promise. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped. Notice that last phrase. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, we ask as we embark upon the study of the Word once again that your Holy Spirit would come and speak to us on a corporate level on an individual level speak to us we ask we need to hear from you bless your Word and the proclamation of the Gospel today in Jesus name Amen well, Paul is writing to Timothy about embracing endurance for the gospel. We have noted that Paul is in prison. He has gone through his preliminary trial. He is days away from being martyred for Jesus Christ. However, prior to his departure, Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy would embrace endurance. Endurance. This is the theme of 2 Timothy. Timothy, of course, was now between the horns of a dilemma. On one hand, he had opposition from the Romans from without. Great waves of persecution were now launched upon the church. And as we noted last week, Paul also said there would be deception that would seek to rise and infiltrate the church from within. In fact, we left off with Timothy being admonished there in chapter 2, verse 26, 
to correct those who are in opposition with humility and truth. And on the heels of this exhortation, Paul now continues in chapter 3 with the same passion, the same instruction, that times Timothy would not get it any easier. There are things on the horizon that the Apostle Paul saw that would seek to discourage Timothy and would seek to challenge the church in standing for the truth. And so Paul writes in context now, as we come into chapter 3, remember, when the manuscripts were written, there were no chapter breaks. So Paul just left this exhortation to Timothy to correct those who are in opposition with humility and truth. And as he comes into chapter 3, he says there in verse 1, know this, understand this. In fact, it's a word that implies personal responsibility to know the truth. He says there, Know this, Timothy, that in the last days perilous times would come. Now, as you read through the New Testament, you'll discover this phrase is actually used many times, this idea of last days. And there are those that would ask, what does that mean exactly? This phrase, last days, speaks of future events that will culminate with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Paul the Apostle is saying, as we get closer to the return of Jesus, there will be perilous times that mark our generation. Another side note to make note of is this idea of perilous literally means difficult, terrible, violent, or exceedingly fierce. And Paul tells us here that the climate of the culture in the last days will be difficult. Now as we survey our world today, there are many that are asking this question, can you please describe to me what will the climate of those days be like? Let me give to you several things to consider. First of all, the Bible tells us the political climate will be difficult. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13 verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled for such things must happen But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And of course, we look at the day in which we live, we see wars, we see rumors of wars. I make it a practice to have the newspaper in one hand, my Bible in the other. If you're a younger generation, it's the iPad in one hand, the Bible in the other, and you're constantly filtering the news through the lens of the Word of God. And of course, what I see, and I'm sure many of you see, is perilous times are upon us. Just reading headlines with wars and rumors of wars to see Russia, of course, wanting to take land from the Ukraine. Did you know that the Bible actually says in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 that Russia will be a major player as a country in the last days. And as you turn on the TV and you see Putin giving his discourse, as you see Russia constantly being brought up, understand that Russia would be mentioned clearly as a superpower in the last days. And we see that to this day. North Korea, for example, threatening the U.S. with nuclear attacks. And now we find this terrorist group known as ISIS, and they're beheading believers in Egypt, believers and non-believers alike. The atrocities are associated with perilous times. Now, in the early 90s, when I was studying through the book of Revelation for my first time, and I came to chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 4, and there you read about In the last days, there will be many that will be beheaded for their faith as martyrs for the gospel that sounded somewhat archaic. It sounded like something from back in the Old Testament. You know, I'm thinking, this is modern day, 1990s, you know, you're going to get shot, you're going to get hurt. What's up with the beheading? It, It just didn't click. But as time has gone on, what are we seeing in front of our face? We see that the Bible, as it predicted, people are being beheaded for their faith. And that will only grow with more intensity as time goes on. 
Boko Haram, another terrorist organization kidnapping 300 school kids and selling them as slaves. Listen, when you see these things, we must understand the political climate of the last days, as Paul says, will get worse. In addition to that, we also know the economic climate. Jesus said that in the last days there will be a push toward a cashless society. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but right now there is there are major nations struggling to find answers with regards to their economy. In fact, last night, France signed this, this bill asking help from the European Union because they didn't want to go bankrupt as a country. These are major countries struggling with their economy and the Bible says that in the last days there will be a scaffolding that will be set that will ultimately lead to what has been called as a one world system, a one world economy, a one world order. And we see of course our technology moving in that direction. Another reminder that when you see these things, look up, your redemption draws near. The Bible tells us not only the not only the, the monetary system, but we also see the religious climate. First Timothy chapter four, verse one, it says that the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines demons. And unfortunately, there is a great apostasy on the horizon and looming towards the church. In fact, I read an article this week in the Christian Post that said former mega church pastor Rob Bell told TV host Oprah Winfrey that he believes Christian churches will become even more irrelevant if they fail to embrace gay relationships and that he sees the Christian umbrella becoming more favorable of homosexuality in the very near future. When Winfrey asked when the church will come on board with same-sex relationships, Bell, the former pastor of Mars Hill Bible Church in Granville, Michigan, said that he believes that the time is, quote, close, and that, quote, we're just moments away from the church accepting it, end quote. These are, these are things that are on the horizon. And listen, as we move closer and closer to the return of Christ, more and more you will find there will be pastors, unfortunately, that will acquiesce to the culture and will be afraid to preach the truth of God's Word. Someone stands from the pulpit and declares that that is a sin. Homosexuality is a sin, just like any other sin. It must be repented of, it must be a person that embraces Christ, receives Christ for cleansing, for salvation, just like every other sin. If someone stands from the pulpit and shares that, there are people right now pushing towards passing laws so that those people can be arrested and ultimately put into prison. This is on the horizon. The religious climate will be difficult. The moral climate, now Paul moves into here in chapter 3, verse 2. As Paul tells us that this moral climate will be difficult as well. He says here, men will be lovers of themselves. It will be a culture consumed with gratifying sinful inclinations. He says men will be lovers of money. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, it says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Interesting, isn't it? In the last five years we've seen our country, $17 trillion now in deficit and another indication, man, there's going to be an overwhelming desire for a love for money. Verse 2, he says here, there will be boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Jesus said, you remember, that as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be when the Son of Man comes again. And you look back in the Old Testament and you realize that the days of Lot were characterized with what we see to this very day. The Bible tells us that we will be moving in that direction. May God help us as the church to be salt and light as this world is getting darker by the moment. Verse 3, he says, there will be slanderers. 
without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Isaiah chapter 5, it says, Woe to that generation that calls good evil and evil good. Verse 4, he says, There will be traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure. Notice that phrase now. Rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Paul tells us that the last days would be inundated with people that are pursuing the love of pleasure more than the love of God. And here's a question for you. Would you agree that we are living in a society that is inundated with the misuse of pursuing pleasure? It's upon us. I read a survey done in November 3rd, 2003 of the 10 moral behaviors evaluated. A majority of Americans believe that each of three activities were morally acceptable. Number one, cohabitation, 60%. And sexual fantasies, 59%. It's okay. That's what they said. Half the adult population felt that abortion, 45%, said it's okay. And having a sexual relationship with someone of the opposite sex other than their spouse was okay, 42%. Are we not living in a generation that's stating that good is evil and evil is good? The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be people pursuing the love of pleasure. And then, Paul says in verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Timothy, whatever you do, don't let them influence you. Don't let them influence you. And what Paul is speaking of here is that there will be a people uh, gravitating towards religion rather than relationship. There was a man by the name of Hendrickson that comments and says this, These people lack spiritual dynamic. They have no love for God, nor for His revelation in Jesus Christ, nor for His people. Hence, since they are not spirit-filled men, it is not surprising that they lack spiritual power. End quote. Paul says they have a form of godliness, a lot of religion. They say the right things. They do the right things. You're a Christian? I'm a Christian. Are you kidding me? Dude, I got a dove on my car. I'm a Christian. Are you serious? Really? Well, how long have you been a Christian? I was born a Christian. I came out a Christian. Well, didn't you know the Bible says you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God? Well, man, I was baptized. I got the water. Are you serious? The Bible says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again, born from above. What does that mean? That means that you and I are spiritually dead to God and we need a rebirth. We need the Spirit to come and live within our life. How does that happen? By placing your faith in Jesus Christ. By believing He died on the cross for your sins. By believing that He rose again. And those that receive and believe are saved by the grace of God and the Spirit of God comes to live within us and He makes us brand new people. That's what the Gospel is. From the inside out, God begins to change. God begins to work. Titus chapter 3, it says, We've been washed with the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel that the Apostle Paul is encouraging Timothy to continue to proclaim. It's not a self-help gospel. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the gospel. We must be a people proclaiming that gospel because it's only through the gospel that people can be transformed and saved by grace. I know because I was far from God. And by His grace, He saved me. And by His grace, He saved you. He saved you. And this same lifeline, this same lifeline that brought you out of the mire, that same lifeline that you took, that brought you out of perversion and wickedness is the same lifeline that saved me. It's the same lifeline that will save people today. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul tells Timothy, understand Timothy, that there will be people that will profess to know God, but in works they'll deny Him. There will be people that have a form of godliness, but there's no power in their life because there's no transformation in their life. And then Paul tells us in verse 6, that imposters will grow worse and worse. Look what he says here. For of this sort are those who creep into households 
and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. Paul says, Timothy, in the last days, will see agents of deception growing more and more and more. Be mindful of that. He says, interesting, he cites an Old Testament example of Janus and Jambres. Many commentators suggest these were the magicians, you remember, that came forward. Some of you saw the Ten Commandments. They, they, they came forward... You remember when Moses threw down the staff, told him to let the people of God go, and Pharaoh said, no, we're not letting them go, and then he throws down the staff and it becomes a snake, and, and then the magicians came forward. Many commentators suggest that these magicians, that's who they were, Janus and Jambres. And when they were given the order, they too threw down their st- snakes, and, and they, or not snakes, but sticks, and they turned to snakes. And then you remember it was Moses' rod that turned into a snake that consumed theirs. And then Charlton grabbed the staff again and said, Now what? What are you going to do now? Let my people go. I love that movie. But Paul is saying that just like there were imposters and counterfeits back in the Old Testament, you will have that same thing in the last days. Perilous times. I was reading an article the other day. Um, regarding the IRS. It's tax season right now, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> and in, in this article, it was stating that um, there's been a lot of fraudulent activity. Groups of people are calling all over the United States uh, claiming that they're with the IRS. Calling cell phones, calling home numbers, and they're giving this mock story that you're in trouble with the IRS. And in the course of, the, of, of their spiel, they ask for personal information. Hey, you know what? If you don't want to be pursued by the IRS, if you don't want federal government getting involved, you need, to, you need to take care of this business right now. So I got the call. I got the call. I had it saved on my, my voicemail, and I came home, and I played it, and I was like, you hear that? I told my wife, you hear that? Federal government is calling me. I'm popular, man. So anyway, I called him back, and I started to ask questions. Who is this, and what's your name? And, and um, you know, and he starts to give his spiel. Sounds super professional. And then, I, then he started to ask personal information, you know. And I said, okay, well, tell you what. Let me, let me get your name, your number. I'm going to call the IRS, and I'm going to verify. And then he, this is what he said to me. He says, oh, yeah, you do that. Make sure you do that. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to do anything that's not comfortable for you. So I was like, wow, okay. So I, call, I, I, I hung up, and... I dialed the IRS, and this guy doesn't check out. So I call him back. And I said, sir, um, uh, you called earlier stating this is who you were, this is who you're representing. And um, I, I went ahead and I, I called, and as soon as I said that, he says, I'm not with the IRS. I said, sir, I have you on my, my recorder. You said your name is, and I said his name, you represent that you work for, and that if I don't give you this information, I'm in trouble. He says, I'm going to use car salesman. I, I'm, I don't work for the IRS. And then I just said, well, sir, um, you're a liar. You're, you're, you're a liar. And uh, what you're doing is, is wrong. And I hung up. Now, my wife then picked up the phone. Because <laughs> I was, I was, I was upset, obviously, and and she was upset, and uh, and she called back this this number, and he answered the phone, and she preached the gospel. She just went for it, man. She's just like, sir, here's the deal. Jesus Christ died for your sin. She went into it, and she said, great will be your judgment. Great will be your judgment and what you are doing. However. God doesn't want to judge you. God wants to forgive you if you turn from your sins and give your life to Jesus Christ. Click. You know, it's like... I was like, you go, girl. It's my wife. Imposters. Growing worse and worse. In fact, 
Paul says in First uh, Thessalonians chapter five to test all things, hold fast to what is true. And then Timothy, of course, no no question after hearing on the heels of living in, in perilous times and these times, of course, growing with great intensity now as we get closer to the return of Christ. Timothy's asking a question in his mind. How am I supposed to weather through all of this? And Paul gives us the answer here in verse 10. He says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, affliction, which happened to me, notice he now says, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so Paul encouraged Timothy, in light of the perilous times that we're living in, follow his example. Follow his example. And Paul does something interesting here. He, he reverts back to his time with Timothy that he had spent in three of these cities, his time in Antioch, his time in Iconium, his time in Lystra, and Timothy was able to see Paul react under extreme pressure, under extreme opposition, and he saw with his own eyes that none of these things moved him. He still was faithful to the gospel. He was still faithfully doing what God had called him to do, and Timothy now had an example to model and to seek to follow Paul's example in his own life. This is what Paul is, is inferring. And then he says in verse 14, but you must, you, you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Notice these words he uses. He says you must continue. Again, understand, Paul is days away from his martyrdom, his impending death. These are his last words given to Timothy, and he's now saying, Timothy, you must continue. You must continue in the foundation that's been laid in your life. Paul was zealously trying to guard the call that God had on Timothy's life, and he's saying, follow me. And secondly, this would be possible through abiding and holding fast to the word of God. Look at verse 16 with me. Paul says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul's saying we're able to weather through perilous times by being and abiding in the Word of God. Folks, you have right now in your hand the Word of God. And this is what's going to help us weather through the times in which we're living. Notice Paul says, all Scripture is given by inspiration. The word there is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. The rabbis taught that the Spirit of God rested on and in the prophets and spoke through them so that their words did not come from themselves, but from the very mouth of God. When you read through the Word and you you begin to study how the Word, the Bible was assembled, you'll begin to see it in in 2 Peter, for example, in chapter 1, it says, "Holy, Holy men of God were moved as the Holy Spirit gave them the Word. And that Word, the idea there is that God... God was controlling them at different moments as the scriptures were being penned. Using their personality? Yes. But making sure that every jot, every tittle was from Him. It was God-breathed. It was God's Word. You and I have been given the inspired, inerrant Word of God. It's a unique book. It's unique from all the other books written in the history of mankind. Unique in its continuity. It was written over 1,600 years span of time, over 60 generations, by more than 40 authors on three different continents and three different languages, and yet it speaks with one united voice on the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have the Word of God. It's unique in its circulation, the most published and popular book ever written. 
It's unique in its survival. It survived the ravages of war, time, persecution, and criticism. And it's unique in its influence. It has had greater influence on culture and literature than any other book in existence, the Word. And Paul tells us here that the way to navigate through perilous times is by taking heed and holding fast to the Word. He says here, notice also in your Bible, it's profitable. This word implies it's useful, it's helpful, it's beneficial for every area of life. This is God's Word. It was A.W. Tozer that said it takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. This is why here at Calvary Chapel we put such an emphasis on the, on the systematic study of the Bible, the systematic study of the Word of God because we believe that every word is useful, helpful, beneficial for spiritual life. In addition to that, the question then is, is what are some ways the Word of God is profitable in our life? Let me give to you from the text four. He says here, it's profitable for doctrine. This word speaks of health. It speaks of the teaching of the Word of God and it's profitable for doctrine what is right. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's Word is is helpful, it's beneficial in what is right. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this but there are times when I get get sick and um, when I really, really get sick and I'm not able to kick it, my, my wife says, all right, you, you need to go to the doctor. <laughs> and I'm just like, like blowing my nose. Seriously, I don't, I'm, I'll be all right. No, you need to go to the doctor. So obviously I go to the doctor, I sit down on the, on the table, you know, there in his office and he'll take the thesoscope, he'll listen to my heartbeat, he'll, you know, weigh me and that's when I get in trouble um, <laughs> when they weigh me. And then, you know, after the full, thorough evaluation, the doctor, you know, with, with, with uh, years of schooling behind his name, he says to me, you're sick. I'm like, yeah, I know. And then, of course, he gives you the prescription. Here's what you need to do to get well. And um, sometimes, you know, they'll say, okay, you you need to go on a diet. You know, you need to trim trim up a little bit because if you don't, cholesterol is going to get out of control and you're going to get in trouble. And... um, I said, Doc, I, I don't, I'm on a diet, actually. I'm on the seafood diet. I see food, I eat it. You know, it's like, it's like no, no, you, you, need to, you need to cut back. And of course, as I follow his instruction, inevitably I get better and I'm, I'm put back on, on track. Well, we have a great physician, Jesus Christ, who oftentimes takes the church to the examining table of life and he'll open the word of God and the word of God is used to examine our lives and and give us instruction on what is right. Anytime you feel spiritually deficient, you feel perhaps beaten up by the world, what, what the great physician will often do is give a prescription, you need more Bible in your life. You need more Bible in your life. Just turn, turn off the TV and Pick up your Bible and spend some more time with God's Word because it's God's Word that's going to help you and me understand what is right. Number two, he says, it's profitable for reproof. This is what is not right. The word reproof carries the idea of exposing error within our life. Now, let me ask you a sobering question. Have you ever been reproved by the Word of God? I have. Many times times when I'm just reading through the Word and I, my attitude isn't right or maybe my perspective on something isn't right and as I'm just reading through the Scriptures how God's Word is able to just reprove me and say, you know what, that's wrong thinking, that's the wrong mindset or that's a wrong attitude and I repent of it, I ask God to cleanse me and I move on. But God's Word has that ability of reproving me. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you, you got like the Holy Spirit spanking. You ever get one of those? I remember years ago when I was living in um, living in Oregon. I just got married. We didn't have a lot. Uh, man, I was like, I think I was I was 21, and um, we we moved from California up to Oregon. I I got my first car. It was a three cylinder. It was awesome. A little justy. 
I was so excited, but we didn't have much. And one occasion, um, you know, because we didn't have much, um, dinner was somewhat scarce. You know, we were like on the Daniel diet. It was like vegetables and that was it, you know. And, uh, and I remember complaining that night to, to my new wife. Where's the meat? I'm a man. I need meat. And, um, and so, you know, obviously, God bless my wife, man. She put up with me. So we go to church, go to Calvary Chapel, Salem. And I sit down in the, like where you're at, and the pastor, his name's Rob Salvato, he opens up the Bible, and just like what we're doing, we're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. We were in 1 Corinthians. He happened to be in chapter 10 that night. And chapter 10 gives the discourse of Israel's history and Paul's admonishing by using Israel's Old Testament history of not to do what they did. And he came to the point where he started to elaborate how the people complained there was no meat. I kid you not. It was like I was the only one in the room. I was like, are, are you like listening in? Like what's going on in my house? Because... Because he was talking about, you know, and he just went on and on. And I was so convicted that when I left church that night, my wife, she didn't say anything. <laughs> she just, you know, looked over and I was just like, I repent. I, I repent. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Man, isn't the Holy Spirit so good at doing that? Ladies, those of you that are married, remember that. The Holy Spirit makes a greater Holy Spirit than you. Okay? <laughs> the Word of God is able to reprove us. Speak right into our life and, and correct that kind of thinking. It exposes error. And then, notice number, number three, it's profitable for correction. It shows us how to get right. It instructs us on what is right. It shows us what's not right. Thirdly, it's profitable for correction. It shows us how to get right. This word, correction, beautiful word, it was used in ancient times to, to set a bone back in its place, to correct it. So something's dislocated. The word was used in ancient times of, of setting a bone back in its place so that it could be used again. It also was used with this idea of something that was wrecked and it was restored back to its original condition. When I was a kid, I had a friend that uh, had a dad that was um, into restoring old cars. And uh, back as a kid, you know, my, my dream was much different than it is now. I mean, I like the Impalas, the low rider thing, you know, and Jesus is good. Let me just say that, you know. All that's been changed. But needless to say... Um, he would restore these old cars. And on one particular occasion, when I went over to visit him, his, his dad had a Model T in the, in the garage. You know what a Model T is? It's one of the oldest cars. And the uh, thing was banged up, mangled, totally just out of shape, big time. And he had it on blocks. And on the weekends, he would have his son you know, pound out the fenders, sandblast the fenders, and, and help put this thing back to its origi original condition. I, and I remember coming over and, and uh, watching what he was doing and asking, you know, what are you doing? He's got a sandblaster. He's like, shh, what does it look like I'm doing? He's like, I'm sanding the car. Do you want to help? I was like, yeah. So I was like, shh. I was learning how to do certain things like that. And, and, um, but I remember when, when this was finished, to see a Model T back in mint condition, interior restored, framework just restored, every, the engine was restored, everything on this car was restored, and to see that thing come out just was absolutely amazing. But that's the idea that Paul is using here when it says the Word of God is profitable for correction in that it brings us back, it restores us back to our rightful condition. How many of you know that at times in life we can find ourselves a wreck? You can find your marriage maybe a wreck or maybe there's a relationship that's, that's gone through some things and it's, it's been wrecked. And you're wondering, how am I going to recover from this? It's the Word of God that's able to come in to that situation in our own personal life and it shows us 
how to get right. It restores us, puts things back in its proper place. And this is what Paul was encouraging Timothy on. And then fourthly, it's profitable for instruction. It tells us how to stay right. How to stay right. God's word has that ability of shooting straight with us and keeping us on the straight and narrow. Paul would say in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, know that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Now, what's the result? Verse 17, as we close here, he says that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I end on that last phrase, thoroughly equipped. Why? Because this, this was the thing that was concerning Timothy. Paul, the perilous times are here. And uh, Rome is coming in from without. Deceptions rising up from within. How do I do this? Paul says, follow my example. I'm about to go be with Jesus, but you follow my example. And you hold fast to the Word of God because the Word of God is going to thoroughly furnish, equip your life. You have everything that you need as you hold to God's Word to take you through the storms of life. Another translation is completely outfitted, fully equipped, so God can use us to our fullest, foolish, not fullest, not foolish. (laughs) Edit that. But, uh, fullest potential. Perilous times. And as we close, ladies and gentlemen, we're in perilous times. And my greatest responsibility to the church, to this flock, and to those that listen online, my greatest responsibility is to hold fast to the Word of God and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come what may. That's what Paul did. That's what the apostles did. That's what so many have done through church history. And now, it's our turn. It's our turn to hold the course, to rise up in love, hold fast to the truth. It might not be popular. It might not be culturally acceptable. I'm I'm the hold fast to the truth of God's Word.